everyone. Thank you for joining us for this program brought to you by the Natural History Museum. My name is Rocio Santoyo from the Public Programs Department. Um, and we are doing a panel conversation um, titled The Earth in Her Hands, 75 Extraordinary Women in the World of Plants. Um, this is based on the book written by Jennifer Jewell. Um, and she is actually going to be one of our panelists today. And three of our other panelists were women featured in her book. Kara Bornstein, uh, Mia Lair, and uh, Lori Kranz. Uh, to moderate this panel, we have Richard Hayden, who is the former head gardener at the Natural History Museum and the current project manager for the new um, uh, La Brea Tar Pits Museum and its uh, landscape. Um, so without further delay, I do want to pass off the program to Richard Hayden, who will be um, speaking with and doing further introductions for all of our panelists today. So thank you and take it away, Richard. Thanks, Rocio, for that wonderful introduction. And it is exciting to talk to these amazing women in horticulture. Um, you know, Jennifer has been one of my heroes. I've been listening to her uh, Cultivating Place podcast. Uh, it's my go-to when I do my garden work and when I do my walks in the morning. And it's such a, a comfort, especially in these times. Uh, so I'm really excited to uh, get to introduce her. Um, uh, Jennifer Jewell is a gardener, as you might be surprised to find out, a gardener, a garden writer, gardening educator, and a garden advocate. She's the creator and host of the national um, award-winning weekly public radio program and podcast, Cultivating Place, Conversations on Natural History and the Human Impulse to Garden. Uh, she worked as a native plant garden curator for the Gateway Science Museum on the campus of California State University in Chico, I was surprised to find out. And she lives and gardens in uh, uh, Butte County, California. Um, so Jennifer, welcome. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's, I have to say that, you know, we, our paths have crossed. We, we actually became Instagram friends. We did. This is how I first found you. And then uh, you were serving on the board of Pacific Horticulture at one of the conferences I attended. And we, we were ships passing in the night. And it's good to finally have a virtual meeting. Yes, yeah, very, very fun. Yeah, and I've enjoyed the book so much. Uh, I was rereading it this weekend, and it is, I realized that the, it is, it's just so full of hope because it's the story of these wonderful women and what they're doing to advocate for the earth and gardens and horticulture in their own backyards or, or, or wherever it is that they're, they're making their impacts. Can you talk a little bit about um, how the book came about and what gave you this idea of kind of documenting this? I know it's kind of part of the work that you've been doing with your with your show, with Cultivating Place. Yeah, Timber Press actually came to me in December of 2017 to ask if I would be interested in writing a book on women in horticulture. And so while it kind of came out of the blue. It was a result of their having listened to the program for the several years it had been in production and them having sent me authors to interview. And I think they were compelled by the way I interviewed and my focus not on how to, but on why we garden and the cultural valuing of gardening and horticulture. And so when they came to me and asked this question, it then sort of uh, kind of morphed into how do you want to write about women and what kinds of women and what is your criteria uh, for those women that would end up in the book. And we ultimately came to a list of 75. There could be 1,500. Richard, there could be there could be ten, and so it's you know that's a conceit uh, that we had to work with, and I um, the, the criteria came down to living women doing really innovative work at the intersections of horticulture and other areas of our world because there are a lot of good humans doing great horticultural work, but my belief is that gardening and gardeners and gardens are these intersectional spaces for really positive change in our world. And those are the people that I wanted to look at. And so when I say that, it sounds a little jargony, but where horticulture intersects with 
community development, where it intersects with environmental impact, where it intersects with economy, where it intersects with gender or social equity on any front. That's what I'm talking about. And that is what these women are doing. Um, and I agree with you. It was an incredibly hopeful year for me to work on the book. And um, it's even more hopeful now when I see um, gardening having come back into people's minds as one of the ways we connect with meaning and survival. Absolutely. And it's interesting that you were talking about those connections because uh, one of my favorite parts from your introduction talks about how the women are sort of connected like uh, my, like fungal mycelia that run yeah. through the soil. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and about how, first of all, you might want to explain what fungal mycelia are to those right. of, our, of our listeners that don't know, but how that came to your, how you've shaped which 75 women you were going to talk about. Well, they sort of shaped themselves. You know, I, I created this Gantt chart kind of thing of, uh, because I, I wanted to make sure we weren't just talking about one area of horticulture. Horticulture means so many things. So I was looking at environmental science and botany um, in people doing really interesting work at the public policy or administration level, floristry, garden design, garden writers, photographers. Um, native plant specialists. And I then, you know, started to try and be representative across these fields to have a selection of people in each one of these categories. And what was so fun was to see the ways that they would be connected to one another through their field or through a research project, or, you know, one person had had a great sort of idea or career that had sparked another one of the women. And so, you know, when we think about how uh, micro microorganisms and fungi and bacteria all live in and animate our soil in order to feed and support our plant life, this is the way I started to see these women, that they were all somehow interconnected through the hypha across the entire globe to spark and feed and support one another, even when they didn't even know each other sometimes. And, you know, sometimes they would be directly related. And um, it was a very, it was a powerful community network to tap into myself. Awesome. And um, you talk about another concept in your uh, introduction that's kind of dear and near to us at the Natural History Museum because we, um, try to be champions of diversity and inclusivity um, in you know, all of our programs and what we're doing um, as a museum of and for and about Los Angeles. And you talk about this idea of decolonize your garden. Yeah. Can, you, can you tell us what that means? And, and um, talk yeah, a little bit I, about I would love to. It's, one, it's very near and dear to my heart. Um, in, and it, it has become increasingly so over these years of doing the podcast. And that is that uh, for, for a whole variety of reasons um, that we don't necessarily need to go into, gardening as sort of presented by mainstream media, glossy magazines and um, you know, special documentaries online, whatever, about the great gardens of the world, uh, because a, again, a variety of reasons, started over the past 75 years, became increasingly narrow in what it represented as what a gardener looked like, what a garden was, and what gardening entailed. And it became very sadly focused on um, exactly what I look like, a middle-class, middle-aged, white, person um, or even more affluent and that a garden had to be like look good enough to fit on the pages of a magazine or be in a documentary and so it became gardens and gardening and gardeners became these sort of like lifestyle destinations you could pick up at a store this weekend and i really uh i am repelled by that uh, perception of gardening. All peoples, all cultures have gardened across time. And I think this really became apparent to me when I started to work in radio because I no longer had to meet the criteria of 
a glossy magazine and the marketers or people who purchased that glossy magazine to support what I wanted to talk about. And um, gardening is, is just one of those powerful places where all people can meet. And uh, I really wanted my book to be representative of that. And it certainly is. It's such a um, such an interesting deep dive into so many different um, cultures and people that are working in so many different ways. Let's actually meet uh, some of those women that you talk about. We're lucky to have three Los Angeles-based folks with us today. The first I want to uh, introduce is Lori Krantz, who um, moved to Los Angeles in the mid '90s to pursue a pursue a career in music. Um, as a singer songwriter and uh, as I've uh, heard so often from gardeners and actually my own story is that you know the earth had different plans and now she is known for her a wonderful company called edible edible gardens LA um, which allows her to be part garden designer part uh, school gardener and part gardening coach and mentor and always a gardening advocate Lori is uh, working to add green edible garden spaces to urban home and education environments undaunted by location and uh, spaces to urban home and educational environments undaunted by location and circumstance. And she has a new book herself called A Garden Can Be Anywhere, Creating Bountiful and Beautiful Edible Gardens. Welcome, Lori. Hello, Lori. Is Lori there? Thank you. Hi. Huh? You see me now? Yes. Hi. I have, I have to say, I was, as I was researching, um, to, to write this introduction, I ran into uh, a podcast that had beautiful pictures of you taken at the Natural History Museum in the Edible Garden. Yes. And so yes. it was so funny that we were able to all kind of connect, all of us LA folks anyway, uh, in, this, you know, in this wonderful museum. And it was great to see you there. I, I love the gardens at the Natural History Museum. They're really special. And in fact, for that, we had to pick a place to meet. Um, and a lot of the gardens I work on are private and harder to meet there. And so I, I love the Natural History Gardens. Let's meet there. So it was great. Yeah, no, actually working in the edible garden there has been one of my, one of my favorite things. And, um, you know, it... You actually have a, a background in um, school gardens, doing garden education. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so I found my way to the garden really when my son uh, started school. He was four and a half, and now he's in college. Um, but I had to sign up for something. And I looked down the list of all the possibilities, and I saw gardening. And I remembered being in the garden with my father. And he went to an office every day, but on the weekends, that was a really special time. I got to just plant watermelon seeds or watch the corn grow, harvest some peppers and tomatoes. And I remembered that and wanted, thought, oh, I can have that experience with my child. And so I signed up for it, not expecting it to lead on the journey that it ultimately did. I just fell madly in love with gardening and gardens and, and uh, forevermore. And then teaching kids how to garden and helping adults learn how to garden. It just, it really took me my whole life in a different direction, just planting those seeds in that first garden. And do you, um, do you find that um, nature plays a role in your edible gardens? Are you bringing in plants for pollinators and other things like that? Oh, the first thing I plant in any edible garden is African basil. Mm. Uh, it brings the bees, it's so extraordinary. I don't, it's the first plant that I put in the ground. And then we can talk about anything and everything else. But to me, that's the most vital part, the heart of the garden. So yes, and, and then beyond that, you know, my way of thinking about gardens is and it's a lot of what Jennifer talks about and um, in her beautiful book which I just I love your book Jennifer and I'm so honored to have a space in it truly um, but I, I kind of think about 
you know, I don't think about the vegetables are in one section and this is in another section. It's all everywhere. It's everything. It is so diverse. That's how, to me, a vegetable garden should be. And so right now, poppies are popping up in the middle of the tomato plants that are just starting and, you know, a little reckless in the fava bean area. But I love all of that. Um, and, and that's the way it should be. So lots of flowers to bring pollinators always. Uh, I, I think it's, it's necessary for our health, for a garden's health. Um. And I, you know, I'm really struck by how it seems like in your career has kind of evolved into all of these different opportunities and you've been with, um, you know, helping in with adult education. And, and recently when we were talking last week, you mentioned that your business had been pivoted to helping out some of the small farmers in our community. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I am. Um... As we all were, our life changed very quickly for all of us a few weeks ago. And I, what I saw happening was that, you know, there were stay-at-home orders and I felt, I didn't feel comfortable coming in and out of people's home gardens anymore. I, I didn't think that was good for me or for my clients. So I chose for this time where all of this is happening in the world to step back. And what I saw immediately, you know, the people who really taught me how to grow food are the farmers from the farmer's market um, in and around Los Angeles, Santa Monica. They've been friends of mine for over 20 years. I just would go and ask questions. And what I saw happening was that the restaurants were closing. And all these beloved restaurants, all the places that would get the food from the farmers. I also knew the farmers had food coming out of the fields that needed, and people needed to eat. And people were saying, I went to the grocery store and there was nothing on the shelves. So I don't, I didn't even really think about how am I going to do this? I just started gathering food from all the farmers and buying through food from them and making farm deliveries where we drop it off, it's contactless, we put it on your doorstep, and that's it. It's, it goes straight from the farmers straight to the people who need the food. Um, and it was nothing, I didn't premeditate any of it, I just saw there was a need for it. And so, yes, I have, uh, that's how I, it's taking seven days a week to, to make sure that this happens that the food gets from the farms to people and the demand for it exceeds what you know just my husband Dean and I and one of our friends can can do between the three of us but we're working really hard to to help support the farmers and help get food to everybody well and they're really beautiful boxes I follow you on Instagram and mm -hmm. Uh, it's great to see, you know, all of that nutritious food getting, you know, put where it's needed. So that's, that's awesome. Let's meet some of you. Thanks, Laura. Um, Thank you. Let's, uh, so my colleague, Claire Bornstein, is the director of collections here at the Nature Gardens at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And, um, she has worked as a champion for California native plants her whole career, actually, having worked previously at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, which is an all California native plant botanic garden. She was there for 28 years, uh, uh, working in different roles as the living collections, uh, also taking care of the retail nursery and doing plant introduction programs. Many of the plants we love in our gardens that are natives, uh, some of them have been introduced by Carol. And she is also the co-author of uh, two books, uh, The Bible of California Native Plants, which is called The California Native Plants for the Garden, and then also Reimagining the California Law. And so welcome, Carol. Carol. Carol's there, there she is. Yeah, here we go. I've just unmuted. Thank you for that introduction. Great to be here. Good to see you. It's so unusual to see you not in a garden. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's been hard these past couple of weeks not being able to go and spend some time at the museum and be in the nature gardens, especially what? with this spring being so spectacular. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
And you've been at the Nature Gardens now, I think it's a little over eight years. So it's, yeah, a little over eight years. That's can right. You talk a little bit about, um, about how the Nature Gardens has, uh, what you kind of feel the big successes of that project are, and have you been able to connect uh, new, a new audience with the importance of gardens, do you think? Well, I, I hope so. I think the answer to that is yes. Um, the project was a very ambitious one, as I know you well know. Um, launched by the museum several years ago um, with the support of the many scientists on the staff, um, the public education people, and um, master planned by Mia Lair, who you're going to be talking to very shortly. Um, and there were a lot of, a lot of goals associated with that project. Um, the primary one was to create habitat for wildlife in an urban setting and to introduce people uh, to nature who may, may have had little to no um, experience, direct experience with living nature. And I, I think that that definitely has been achieved. Um, a lot of the people who come to the museum still kind of stumble upon the gardens and um, when they're out there, whether it's just wandering on their own or taking part in some of the many programs that we have, um, I, think, I think we are sparking an interest in making some of them into future gardeners, um, certainly getting them engaged in paying attention and, and becoming aware of all of the living things around them. Um, the other thing that, um, that I'm particularly pleased about with the Nature Gardens is that it's an, a wonderful example of the fact that you can have a garden that supports wildlife and also be beautiful and functional and sustainably managed. So, the demonstration aspect of that, I think, is pretty powerful. You know, um, I learned so much about California native plants. I hate to say taken for granted, but I've come to understand, it's funny, I was walking this morning and, I, and every time I walk in my neighborhood, I'm always looking for the natives, you know. There's, there was a, an Alan Chickering sage in the parkway that I found and I always take, you know, a little bit to get that old factory, that wonderful, fragrance. Can you uh, remind, remind us why planting natives is so important? I would love to. Um, first, I, I always uh, give a shout out to the fact that so many of our 6,000 plus California native plants are incredibly beautiful as landscape, um, for, as plants for our gardens, as ornamentals. Of course, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I, I do feel very strongly that that is a significant attribute of so many California native plants. Um, another is that they um, give us a sense of, of place that we are here in California. And of course that applies to native plants anywhere around the globe. Um, they reflect where you are at any given moment in time. And, and especially here in California where we have um, people who have um, moved here from all over the world and made um, California a culturally diverse place. They've also brought plants from all over the world and many of those work really well here in our Mediterranean climate but a lot of them don't so much. They are very resource intensive and with resources um, are some of them are very limited and quite precious and valuable. Um, using native plants that are climate appropriate is a way to garden I think more sustainably and responsibly. So that is another reason to encourage the use of natives in our gardens. And then the fact that they are very functional, uh, utilitarian. There's practically a native plant that can fulfill just about any function that you might have in a garden that you are creating. And then, of course, the habitat value, supporting especially local wildlife, um, which has um, throughout much of our state where we now reside, we've lost so much of the natural areas and those were homes to all the thousands and thousands of creatures that preceded us who evolved here with those plants and so trying to recreate and bolster those ecosystems is a very valuable thing to do so Absolutely. those are a few reasons yeah i'm i'm well preaching to the choir here but right i know good to be reminded do you th if if um I mean, I love this question. This came to us from a, a fellow colleague of ours um, who said, if you had one superpower, 
and could persuade the world to do just one thing in the support of nature and gardens, what would it be? Yes, you love that question. I, I have a hard time with that question um, because I can't think of just one thing. Of course, there's so many. I can give you a hint. Your, your second book was about it. Well, yes. <laughs> That's on my list, actually, is if you can't bring yourself to completely remove your lawn, reduce the size of it or change it to a lawn that is, or the way you manage your lawn, that you manage it more sustainably instead of um, um, being so consumptive of resources. So yes, that would definitely be near the top, if not the top of the list. There are others, you know, stop using toxic chemicals, stop using inorganic fertilizers, um, plant more natives. I, mean, I could go on, but I, I won't, we'll stop there. It's, I mean, it's a question I had to ask because with all my walks in the neighborhood these days, it's, mm -hmm. I'm, it's amazing how, I just think like how many animals and wildlife could we support if we just changed the way we, we treat our, we dress our front lawns. It's just. I, I agree. I, I completely agree. There's still a lot of converts we need to make out there. Yeah. Thank you. So, um. Let's move on to, uh, to someone who, as we mentioned, is, uh, we are connected to because she was um, um, one of the designers of the Nature Gardens. Mia Lair is a landscape architect originally from Ecuador. Uh, she is Harvard trained and the founder and president of Studio MLA, which is a Los Angeles, and I realized doing some research meeting, you're also in San Francisco now, based design studio and they integrate landscape architecture, urban planning, and design. And it's a 45-person team that Mia oversees that is known for using advocacy and diversity to create places that inspire human connection, unite communities, and restore environmental balance. That's some heavy lifting. Some of Mia's many high-profile projects include the LA River Revitalization Master Plan, uh, Dodger Stadium, and of course, uh, the Nature Gardens here at the Natural History Museum. Welcome, Mia. So, um, thank you for, uh, for having me with this group of wonderful women uh, who love gardens, and uh, a man who loves gardens, too. So <laughs> thank you, and, uh, I wanna, I wanna just mention that I actually um, am Salvadorian. I'm from El Salvador. It uh -oh. often, no, it's okay. We all speak Spanish and actually this very similar Spanish all across Latin America. We all understand each other. So, and it starts with an E and ends with an O-R. So it's good. <laughs> Thank you for that correction. So, um, you know, there's such a through theme in the book of um, how many of you came to um, do the work that you do. And I loved how it talks in, 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 um, in your descriptions of your work, how you had a turning point in your career when you started focusing with, on working with environmental organizations and how mm -hmm. you kind of got into that work and, and came to see nature access and social justice as some of the things that you were gonna strive for. Can you tell us a little bit about that evolution? Sure. So uh, one of the uh, when I started and had some babies, um, I started my practice doing gardens, and uh, I was doing gardens um, for wonderful Hollywood folks that gave me a lot of latitude. And uh, at some point, uh, I realized that there was the incredible connection to schools and the school environments and the streets in our neighborhoods and organizations like Tree People and then very soon after that um, the Los Angeles River poet and advocate Lewis McAdams. So it was kind of a, this, uh, this moment in my time is like I can be doing these gardens but I also have been trained to think about some, some important issues about city, city life, people, people, how they live in cities. And I started engaging um, as a volunteer um, with uh, my kids cleaning the LA River, which would be happening around now, 
if we weren't uh, sort of in, in COVID-19 mode. Um, and uh, started really understanding uh, in the same way that I had met a lot of gardeners and actually uh, nurserymen who were Central American, who were just wonderful people with whom I related to very deeply. Um, and we would, you know, really uh, sort of test things out together um, in, over time. I still occasionally see them um, in some of my projects. They've been in, in, nursery, in the nurseries or in the con with contractors for 20, 30 years. So I started realizing that these people were living in, in the city in a way that they started um, really using the city, whether it was for... Um, hiking, biking, or playing soccer, certainly, and that there was, the, there was this correlation between their uh, sort of cultural needs, their, their, their sort of the way they lived um, and, and used the city, the, the school, um, and how I could contribute, and it gave me tremendous uh, satisfaction to start learning oh i could be doing schools and then i started doing public schools and i started um uh, sort of advocating for river projects together with the poet and other activists and uh eventually led me to some interesting projects like the uh, uh, vista hermosa park which is right next to LA, LASD High School, but overlooking downtown Los Angeles. And that was a 10 acre park that did, you know, many of the things we all sort of advocate for at this point, which is uh, using native plants, trying to use the least amount of lawn possible, harvesting the water, recycling, reusing the water, and uh, creating spaces uh, with natural materials that were what we called windows to the mountain and eventually mountains and that eventually led to um, sort of the, the Natural History Museum which I think I, I call it an ur urban ecological laboratory because I think it's obviously not a full restoration uh, just by 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 virtue of the fact that it's really hard to do a restoration and have people use the space in the, in the, in the way the museum needed to use it for all its, its different functions. But it was a new door, um, a, a new face for the museum to the world. Um, it was no longer the back door. It, was, it went from being an asphalt parking lot to being a garden that gave life. And, um, you know, it was an incredible sort of experience working with the educators and uh, in what I called my ologist meetings, which is mm -hmm. all the scientists that, that I work, that we work with. And we neg negotiated plants, like I negotiate plants with people in the office, which usually requires a bottle of wine because the arguments get really heated. It's not just, don't you like that? Oh, you know, everybody has a reason why something works or something doesn't work. Well, so, the thing too has been able to watch all of the, we get a lot of young people, a lot of children that come to the museum and to see them have some of their first experiences with nature, you know, yes. the pond and the woods and all of that experience is, you know, the, you know, having gotten a chance to kind of, I considered myself to be, when I was working as the head gardener, to be the urban park ranger. <laughs> beautiful garden that you had created and the best part was getting to see all of the community that came in and got to be introduced you know right so I have a quick question mm -hmm. you've been so great about developing uh, I know from knowing some folks that have worked for you about nurturing uh, you know people that are coming up through the profession and really looking to kind of create a, a diverse working environment if you had any advice to give to maybe the next generation that Jennifer is going to write about in her book, what, what kind of advice would you give to the young woman coming up in horticulture now? Coming up in horticulture now? Well, horticulture, okay. or design, or... Uh -huh. or uh -huh. um, well, first of all, you know, don't wait for the knowledge to come to you. Go out to it. 
you know, you, you need to go to botanical gardens, you need to visit parks, you need to go, you need to be proactive um, and, and go to nurseries um, and, uh, and experience nature. And, uh, and then start seeing, you know, start really, uh, and find your own voice. Uh, I, I mean, I grew up in, in the tropics with a father who was just uh, in awe of nature and every hummingbird and every, you know, orchid, uh, every bromeliad, everything was like amazing, amazing, come and look. And um, I just think that you have to find a voice and what we do here in the office is we ask people to engage somehow in, in, in professional sort of uh, activities, whether it's volunteering uh, for a, an organization that perhaps does uh, parks and, and works in, in, in schools uh, or, or plants, uh, so sort of vegetable gardens, uh, to taking young photographers from a program called Las Fotos and having them experience the LA River and then uh, have, explaining to them because you know it's 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 kind of a uh, all this infrastructural work that we all do and which we are you know I think in Los Angeles you end up sort of um, sort of drawn to it in some ways a lot of I think is uh, is uh, is complex it's you know a, infrastructure, how we drink, how we get on a car, how we get electricity, all those things come together. So I just, when young people come to the office to spend a summer or to have a year's, uh, you know, experience, I always, you know, we always have sessions here where people talk about whether it's ecology or fire, fire issues, and we encourage them to participate in the, of course, Friday night programs at the museum because they come with fun and uh, learning. And uh, it's just a, it is a profession that is, a, it's a calling. I think you can't do this profession nine to five. Right. Um, it is, becomes a, pre, a life's pre preoccupation and uh, sort of passion. I tell my daughter that, oh, I can't wait. Maybe one of these days I'm going to retire. And she, goes, she rolls her eyes and says, yeah, right. It's not going to happen. And, you know, it's just, uh, it is my passion. And, uh, and I like to also let young people know that, you know, decisions are political and, you know, that supporting people that you believe in who care about the same things that you believe in socially, environmentally, um, you know, economically, you need to participate in um, in the way cities work, and they welcome your participation. So, being a you know, making sure people uh, sign up to vote, and uh, making sure we vote for the right things, including um, water and water management, or issues uh, that are coming up in and will come up in the next year given sort of some shortfalls we're going to have right now. So I think engaging and I think that what we, I see from this group, all of us are engaged and uh, that that's, um, you're not divorced from nature, you're attracted to nature and to people in place and, and that's, uh, that's what makes me tick. That's wonderful. So tell, tell us how we can f keep track of you in the future. How can we follow you? Do you have a website? You have an Instagram. Right. Don't you? At some point I can give you any other accounts, but our, our studio is www.studio-mla.com. And we do have, uh, you know, several other ways to communicate through it. And I can, we can, I th if it's not on refresh, we just refreshed it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, obviously and uh thank you so much for for this afternoon it's a nice distraction thank you Mia. it's been great to talk to you i'm going to go back to Lori and ask her the same question Lori. how can we follow you and keep track of you um i do have an instagram which is edible gardens la and it's and a that, beautiful, by the way it's very beautiful thank you and we have a website edibleGardensLA.com. and your book and the book, A Garden Can Be Anywhere, yes. If you would okay. like to grow some food. Great. Thanks, Laurie. It's great talking to you. Thank you so much. How about you, Carol?
Where do we find you if we want to come back? Well, you can reach me through the Natural History Museum. Um, I don't, my, I have a, a website, but um, probably easiest to, to find me through the Natural History Museum. Um, and also I encourage people to follow um, the Instagram account that uh, primarily one of our gardeners, Alicia Peterson, has been doing a fabulous job of uh, curating for us and that's NHMLA um, Nature Gardens. Um, she's been posting almost every day um, these last couple of weeks while we've been closed. So check that out. NHMLA underscore Nature Gardens. Underscore Nature Gardens, yes. Yeah. And it's actually, it's, it's been a really fun feed to watch. She's been doing it. I agree. Thing. And that takes me back to Jennifer. Jennifer, um, tell us where we can find you. Tell us a little bit about. Well, you can find me at cultivatingplace.com or you can subscribe to the podcast, Cultivating Place, which is everywhere you want to get a podcast, uh, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud. Um, I'm on Instagram at cultivating underscore place. And of course, you can find me in the book. And um, interestingly, my second book will come out in February of 2021. And the Nature Gardens is one of the gardens featured in the book called Under Western Skies. Ah. About 30 six, I think, visionary gardens around the U.S. West. And uh, Carol and her team there were part of the, part of the interview process. And it'll, it's really wonderful to be able to feature those beautiful gardens and the work the, uh, the Nature Gardens and the Natural History Museum are doing. I'm so excited to hear that. I was going to ask what's next. And um, I think that's a great idea because there's so many under Utila, under understood, under understood, is that a word? But um, so many gardens on the West that could be highlighted and I think that's a great opportunity. So we really look forward to that. And it has been, I have to say, just a thrill to talk to you and um, hope I uh, held up my end of the bargain talking to such a gifted interviewer. Um, and it is a great book. I hope everyone goes out to get it. And I uh, wanna thank the folks in the program team at NHM for uh, allowing us to have this chat today. So good gardening, everybody, and uh, we'll see you in the garden. Thank you. Bye. So with that, I wanna thank all of our panelists and our moderator for this talk today. Um, we were just so honored for you guys to give us a little bit of time to put this program together. Uh, once again, I want to encourage everyone, please go out and read The Earth in Her Hands, 75 Extraordinary Women Working in the, in the World of Plants. Um, we really hope to see you all at the Natural History Museum very soon. In the meantime, take care and thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm.